everybody. It is Monday, February 12th, 2024. Welcome to episode 76 of the Old Mage MTG podcast. We had a wild night last night. Our post-Super Bowl trip to Jim Mitchell's for $10 pitchers lasted longer than expected, but we are now fully recovered and we are ready to discuss our favorite children's card game. What are our MGG, MTG topics for today? I screwed that up last week and I screwed it up again this week. I'll probably screw it up many weeks into the future too. It's hard to say MTG topics. We've got a few. We've got some deck talk. We're going to review some sick decks from Ice Age Alliances. We're going to talk a little bit about the Alice format where your Ice Age Alliances only brews can really shine. And we're going to take a look at a recent Secret Layer Super Drop. This is the Winter Super Drop 2024. But first, we have a word from our not sponsor. Today's podcast is not sponsored by Ermin Lawrence Woodworker. Do you love wood? Do you love wooden spoons, bowls, end grain cups, shrink pots, and more? all carved or turned from Minnesota's finest woods. Then check out the current offerings of Ermin Lawrence Woodworker. Head on over to the Instagram of at Ermin Lawrence. Browse the wares. Send him a DM if you see something that piques your fancy. Tell him the old mages sent you. Since that was a not sponsor, it won't help us out, but you can help us out in other ways. One, you can click the like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell if you have not already. Next time you have cardboard or cardboard accessories to purchase on TCG Player, you can do so via our affiliate link, which you can find in the episode description below. That's the second way you can help us out. The third way is we also have a buy me a coffee if you want to throw us a couple bucks. I haven't mentioned that. I think I mentioned it when we first started it, but I haven't talked about it since then. That's nice too. You're not going to get anything in return for that. As of now, we don't offer any extras, but if you just have like two bucks, you don't know what to do with, you want to throw it our way, we'll accept it. That's the end of our shilling. The not sponsor is not shilling. Armin Loris is not sponsoring us. No, we're kind uh, of sponsors for him right now. There's no sponsorship at all here. No sponsorship in either direction. Uh, I think I have to say that legally. Oh, there okay. is, but there's literally no sponsorship in either any direction. Any direction. Uh, now I think it's time to get in the episode. We're going to start with a follow up. I got a follow up today, Alex. Last week we talked about, and I don't remember why we talked about, maybe, maybe you'll remember why we talked about this deserted temple. No, oh, don't ask me to remember things. I said. It was in the that deck. I did, did not have a deserted temple. This is not an important follow-up, but you know, I found out later that I was spreading misinformation. I said I don't have a deserted temple. I do, in fact, have a deserted temple. And the reason why I wanted to bring that up is because loyal viewers of the Old Mage MTG podcast will know that I've lied to them because they watched me pull this deserted temple out of a Lord of the Rings collector booster pack. You could see our Blood Oath episode. I pulled this out of the, out of a pack live on the show. I can't remember what episode it was, 20 something potentially, where you and I swore a blood oath. I don't know if you remember this blood oath or not, but you better. Because if you ever break the blood oath, the the penalty is death. I can't even break the blood oath now, right? Like the, the one ring is gone. It's not, that not was not the blood oath. You forgot the blood oath, Alex. Oh, the other the rings blood, too, right? Any serialized card. Okay. I believe was the blood oath. Okay. We can go back. It's a, it's either any serialized ring. So that includes the any of the human, dwarven, or elven yes. rings. But I believe it was any serialized card. If you or I ever, from that the time that episode was filmed well, in perpetuity. All right. If we ever pull a serialized card out of a Lord of the Ring collector booster, we have to sell that card and we divide the proceeds 50-50. Okay. It's good that I'm reminding you of this because you yeah. forgot about it. And I wouldn't want to have to kill you at some point in the future. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Thank you. But I do have a deserted temple. I have I have this one. This one that you were talking about that you thought was pretty cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I almost you... said 
you have one of those, don't you? While we were talking about it, because I wasn't even paying, I wasn't paying attention to the fact that you said you don't have a deserted temple. I forgot about it. I forgot about it. Anyways, that's the only follow up I have to last episode. Very good. Segment one. Let's get right into segment one of episode 76. I'm calling this segment Deck Talk. More specifically, some Ice Age Alliances deck talk. We've been going through those two sets and also Homelands the last few weeks so far. That's how we've started this year. We've taken a journey back to the old Ice Age block. Uh, now I want to discuss some of the decks that people were building back in the day from this card pool. We're going to go back to Pro Tour 1996 Columbus, where the format was block constructed. They used only cards from Ice Age and Alliances. Okay. The first one that I wanted to talk about is a deck that some have called the worst deck to ever win on the Pro Tour. <laughs> that is disgusting slander, by the way. I love this deck. I well, love besides, this. I mean, that's going to be a function of like what the I know constructed block was of the time. So, but also like, you know. Ice Age Alliance says, yeah, it's low power. We've talked about that over the last several weeks. But they did have like, you know, there were Nec Necro was in that in that card pool. Uh, I love that somebody won the Pro Tour with some Chonky Spiders. This yeah. deck was all about Chonky Spiders. And there are some peculiarities about this deck that we'll get into. Some things that were kind of unusual. But at the same time, uh, Ole Rod, he had a solid strategy for the meta. Uh, it's also the type of deck that I enjoy. You know, the kinds of deck I enjoy aren't necessarily the kinds of decks that other people enjoy. I don't like to play necessarily broken decks. I don't like to even necessarily pick up the best, you know, one of the best decks in the format. I kind of like to play a boring little mid-range deck that just wins 50% of the time as long as you do all the right things. Because I feel like I'm playing magic when I when I play these decks. Mm -hmm. casting spells you know some creatures you got some removal you got disruption doing things on curve nothing unfair at any turn it's very boring to a lot of people but it's the kind of magic that in results in a lot of back and forth a lot of slow games that's kind of what i like to do i like to let the game evolve for a little while i like back and forth it's not fun for me to just blow out somebody and and turn four I understand the joy of doing that when a new set comes out and you're 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 dealt this new card pool mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily know what the best cards in this card pool are going to be and you're looking at what's in front of you and you're thinking what's what's the best possible deck you could build for the first time what kind of innovations could you make you know yeah. that's exciting the first person that finds out something broken to do I understand that drive that's very interesting but once people already know like how good a deck is, I don't really like to sleeve that deck up and just like yeah, people out I don't, in three, four turns. I mean, you can tell like that's not the way I build decks. I don't really go out and like try to copy like a tournament winning deck or whatever. No, like, you're a brewer. Yeah. I start with like some like kind of janky card that's maybe like brewer. meh. And I'm like, can I make this good? Like <laughs> not all the time. That's not what I always do, but I like to do that. And I like to, yeah, just start with cards that pique my interest or maybe, you know, a general idea that, that I think will be fun to brew around. But there's nothing broken here. Everything's entirely fair, and it's an aggressive creature-focused deck, which is something I've always enjoy, enjoyed. The deck is Red-Green Bugbind by Ole Rod. It's a deck full of bugs and Stormbind, hence the Bugbind, and other Ice Age Alliances cards we've been discussing these last couple weeks. Um, I pulled this deck up on Moxfield, and I'm going to go through it. <clears throat> and I'm going to start with the creatures. It is a horde of creatures with special abilities. There's 21 creatures in this deck. He has uh, four Finhorn Elves, which is just the Ice Age Lanoir for ramp. He has a Mox Monkey in this deck. There are no Moxes to bash in this format, but he can deal with uh, Zurin Orbs. Which was floating was around. Say, yeah. That's probably the main reason you would want to main deck a, a Gorilla Shaman in Ice Age Alliance's format. And 
the key, I think, to this deck's success was he had a group of other creatures, all of which could survive a pyroclasm. And he runs one pyroclasm in this deck. So pyroclasm is the one colorless, one red sorcery that deals two damage to each creature. This was like the big sweeper. This was the most popular sweeper in the format at the time, at least creature-specific sweeper. And most of his creatures, with the exception of the Land of War Elves and the Gorilla Shaman, I guess the Deadly Insect too, but a lot of his creatures could survive the Pyroclasm. So if he had a Pyroclasm in his hand and he was playing somebody that was running a lot of 1-1s, 2-2s, he could always hold some of these creatures in his hand, like the Deadly Insect, until a little later. If he didn't want to lose it to pyro Pyroclasm. The Finhorn, he's going to lose to the Pyroclasm, but ideally you've already used this to ramp something out a little faster. So if you lose it, it's not a big deal. And the Deadly Insects too, like they're so aggressive and fragile maybe that like maybe he brings them out to get something done and then they're gone by the time he uses the Pyroclasm, or at least the first one is, you know? That's true. But he'll lose those to the Pyroclasm, but what he won't lose is his Giant Chapter Spider, which is one colorless, one red, one green. It's two, three. And you can pay one colorless, one red, one green and tap it to remove from the game target creature, which doesn't have flying and is attacking you. At the same time, you remove giant trapdoor spider from the game. So he was running four giant trapdoor spiders. That's a lovely card. Pyroclasm won't remove his orcish cannoneers, which is one colorless, two red, one three. You can tap it to deal two damage to target creature or player and three damage to yourself. Pyroclasm won't remove your Storm Shaman, which we talked about, I think, last episode. Two colorless, mm -hmm. one red, oh, 04 with fire breathing. One, pay one red, give it plus one, plus zero into one to turn. And then Pyroclasm also won't kill your Wooly Spider, which is one of the cards I definitely remember from Ice Age back in the day. I, I liked this card a lot. Yeah, one of it's my favorites. One colorless, two green, two, three. Can block creatures with flying if Wooly, Sp Wooly Spider is assigned to block a creature with flying. Wooly Spider gets plus zero, plus two until end of turn. So we always like this because, I mean, we were one of us was always running a Sangir or Sarah Angel. So a Wooly Spider is a Sangir blocker, a Sarah Angel blocker. Four Wooly Spiders, if I didn't mention that. So he's got eight spiders in this deck in red green bug bind. Uh, the Deadly Insect I just mentioned, he does run four of the Deadly Insects. We talked about, I think last episode or the episode before, how but this guy isn't going to do much for you unless you can clear the way for him. One of the downsides of the Deadly Insect is it has six power, but it doesn't have trample. Yeah. And so many things are going to block it and kill it because it just has one toughness. Yeah. But it is good, like, if you can clear clear the way for this guy. And in this deck, you do have a lot of direct damage to clear the way for the insect. Uh, you have incinerates. You have the pyroclasms, which you could play before you played your deadly insect to clear the way. You have lava burst, which is like the Ice Age fireball. One red, one X, sorcery. Lava burst deals esque damage to target player or creature. Effects that prevent or redirect damage cannot be used to protect that creature. And then you also have Orcish Cannoneers. So, you know, this is a, a a weird card. It's not the best card. You tap it to deal two damage to target creature or player, but it deals three damage to you. That sounds bad, but if you need to tap this to blow a 1-1 one -one off the opponent's side of your board, which will then allow you to attack for six with your Deadly Insect, Mm -hmm. Taking that three damage is not a bad trade-off, you know. Or like if your pyroclasm isn't enough to finish off one of their yep. you know, the biggest yes, creature, yes, yes. you can or orcish cannoneer it, you know. Uh I was for totally forgetting about that, but yeah, that's true. Like you can have your army of three, four toughness creatures out. You can pyroclasm and then tap your orcish cannoneers to deal with one of their four toughness creatures. Mm-hmm. Well, where your three and four toughness creatures survive. Yeah. Another thing you could do is if you don't have enough mana to lava burst the creature all the way, like maybe you can only like lava burst for four or five, you know, yeah. use the cannoneer for the rest since it doesn't require mana. 
So it definitely is helpful sometimes. It's especially nice that you can just tap it. You don't have to feed additional mana into it. So it makes it easier yeah. to, yeah, like incinerate plus tap the Orcish Cannoneers. Lava Burst plus Orcish, uh, tap the Orcish Cannoneers. It's not difficult to clear out a, a four toughness or five toughness creature in those cases. Uh, sorcery is an instance. Seven sorcery is six instance. There's just a variety of removal and direct damage options here. You got your pillage, bury target artifact or land. You got your Joko Hops, which he ran one Joko Hops in this deck. A lot of, you know, uh, competitive decks from this era ran Joko Hops. Some of them were very much focused on the Joko Hops strategy. I think he ran one here for a lot of reasons why I met. A lot of the same reasons why I might just put one Joko hops into a deck where I was running red. Like sometimes you just kind of find yourself getting overwhelmed and it's nice to have a reset. Yeah, just the reset. So maybe he just threw one in here in case, you know, in case you need a reset. Even if you are, if you have a better deck, uh, even if you're running a favorable match every once in a while, you just find yourself behind. You had a bad draw or something. It's nice to have a reset option. Giant growth, I didn't mention that, but, you know, we know why you put giant growth in decks to giant growth things, to give them plus three, plus three out of nowhere. You can't giant growth the insect, which is bad. The deadly insect has shroud, but you can giant growth everything else. Mm -hmm. I find myself putting giant growth in every single deck where I have green. It doesn't always survive. Sometimes I remove it. But I usually start with at least two giant growths. And like That's how game. I used to be, for sure, like you know, a long time ago. Now with so many more cards and some, you know, very good, you know, other things you can play, I'm finding myself getting away from it some. But yeah, I've always been like a giant growth. So it's just been like a core card for me. It is true also that like creatures, especially green creatures, it seems have gotten just even bigger. So yeah, yeah sometimes you can just not worry about the giant growth because now you have five, five that you can play for four mana. I like the surprise factor for it, of it though, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> Enchantments. Only one enchantment. He has two copies of Stormbind. We've talked a little about, about Stormbind. I am starting to rebuild Ice Age Alliance, my Ice Age Alliances collection, because I want to start brewing decks from this era, because I think it's a pretty fun era, as long as you're not trying to play against people who have Power Nine in their decks or have their decks full of, you know, powerful cards from the Urza's block. If you're playing a low power low power meta it's still fun to play with a lot of these cards especially I like that they're cheap stormbind is one of the more powerful cards from ice age one colorless one red one green enchantment pay two colorless discard a card at random from your hand to have stormbind deal two damage to target creature or player again another method of doing damage to creatures or players so another thing that you can combine with an incinerator a lava burst or a pyro pyroclasm to do even more damage to a creature if you need to take out a five toughness creature or a six toughness creature it's also yeah. good that you can go straight to the face with it uh this deck might look kind of slow compared to some decks but in the ice age uh block it was actually a fairly fast deck to get out you know two toughness or sorry two power three toughness creatures for three mana not all that slow uh so you could have a fast start but you might, you probably won't be able to necessarily do 20 points of damage uh, very quickly. But if you do 10, you can then whittle away your opponent with Stormbind. A lot of decks from this era were like blue-white control decks that were based a lot around uh, Kelderon Outpost and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And it takes them and Thawne Glaciers to put up a big mana base to pay like, to then play high casting cost creatures. It takes those decks a while to get going. So before they really get going, you might be able to do a good 10 damage, like I said, with these, these faster creatures. Then they have up their wall. Then they get their generating soldier tokens every turn. They got blockers for all your stuff. What do you do? Well, you can just start discarding cards to Stormbind and going straight to their face to do two damage to finish them off. So Stormbind yeah. is very good. I mean, yeah. If you need to kill them, you could, you know, if you have a decent sized hand, you can just hit them for eight right there. Mm-hmm. And then the artifacts. 
The artifacts are the most unusual part of this deck to me. I know people run these baubles. I don't necessarily love the baubles. We've talked about why bobble is in pre-modern burn now. Uh, when we mentioned that a few episodes ago, I was forgetting one of the most obvious reasons why bobble would be in pre-modern burn. Ryan from Ohio reminded me. You know, it's one more card that goes directly into your graveyard that can that can feed your Grim Lava Mancer. So while it on its own doesn't have a great ability, it's zero mana, you play it, you use its ability, it goes into your graveyard, then it's food for the Lava Mancer. That's well, not the is... case here, because you don't have Lava Mancer yet. Yeah. Sorry. Keep going. The Bobbles. We got four Urza's Bobbles here, which is zero Obviously. casting cost, and two Lodestone Bobbles. What were you going to say, Alex? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Keep, keep going. <laughs> okay. What I was going to say next now is, what do you use the Lodestone Bobble for? So Lodestone Bobble is, we talked about this last episode, I think, zero colorless artifact. You pay one colorless and tap it to sacrifice Lodestone Bobble. Then put up to four target basic lands from any player's graveyard on top of his or her library in any order. That player draws a card at the beginning of next turn's upkeep so you get lands back from your graveyard they go on top of your library so that's what you're going to be drawn so you might as you better make sure you want those lands mm -hmm. or else you're just going to be drawing things you don't want for the next four turns mm -hmm. but it also allows you to then draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep this is from the slow trip era yeah of current cantrips also as we pointed out last episode they say you can put up to four target basic lands yeah. from any player's graveyard on top of his or her library. So you can choose zero if you want. Or just one. And I was thinking, so with this, I'm thinking... Or two or three. Uh, for starters, with Ice Age, you might be worried about running into some land destruction. We have talked about how every color had land destruction. In the format. So, you know, this it's might be like you know a, a way to get some of your lands back if they take out all your green mana or all your red mana or whatever. Yeah. Um, it works blue. Well I shouldn't say Joker. every color. Huh? I shouldn't say every color had land destruction. That's not true. I don't think blue had land destruction. White, I mean, Armageddon was in the base set, but it wasn't in uh, uh, Ice Age or Alliances. You did have more land destruction in this meta, though, than most others. You had Ice Quake in black. You had Thermokarst mm -hmm. in green. You had Stone Rain in red. You had Jokel Hops. You just mentioned Jokel Hops. Yeah. And with Jokel Hops, this is pretty nice because, you know, it's going to wipe out all your lands, but then you can play the bubble for free and get some lands back if you need to. Or you can Jokel Hops and then, like, uh, you know, stack them with four lands so they don't get to do anything for a couple of yeah. turns. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was thinking. What do you run the Lodestone Bobble for? Like, when do you use it? I thought maybe with Jokel Hops most of the time. Use it in the two different ways you just mentioned. You can wait till you get a handful of spells that you can oh. cast within a couple turns, then Joko hops, then bobble, put your four lands back on top of your deck, then you can rebuild faster and play out those spells faster that you already had in your hand. Also, uh, if you maybe end up discarding a uh, land that you didn't want to with the Stormbind, you can get it back Yes, with the Lodestone Wall. Yeah, yeah. Or you can use it, like you said, uh, if your opponent if you if your opponent is in a situation where they might not want to be drawn more land, yeah, you can put four land back on top of their deck and say have fun for the next four turns. It could also just be to concentrate your deck and draw another card. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, just the card draw for one mana, one mana draw one card. There's right. uh some quotes I read about this deck. One was Urza's Bobble and Lodestone Bobbles made his deck effectively six cards smaller, therefore speeding it up even more. So okay. here's somebody who believed that, you know, they're just here to concentrate the deck. Pull one of these for zero mana, play it right away, sack it, get something else. Uh, sometimes I get a little bit confused by this use of these bobbles, these zero casting cost bobbles. I 
understand it more in burn because I've looked at the burn card pools in different meta and I'm like, okay. I think in some cases, like the most effective way to build a fast and efficient burn deck might be just to have these 56 spells in it. And I don't want to add anything more. Any other, any other four cards that I would want to add to get up to 60 are just like, they're just less effective, less efficient than the 56 I already have in here. So if you just throw the baubles in, you know, it concentrates. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that doesn't seem to be the case. And I don't know that it's the case here. Like, couldn't putting in just two more giant growths also speed up your speed up your deck even more? Potentially get through three more extra damage in an early attack just for one green. That seems yeah. like it would be speeding giant up growths the deck are better. conditional though. Is one thing I always try to remind myself about them. Like you have to have creatures down to use them on. Uh so you if you it end up with giant growths in your starting hand, uh they're kind of like dead weight, whereas the the you know you can use the bobble. You have to have creatures to use them on, and also even if you do get an early attack and you have the ability to giant growth to try to push through early damage, if they have any blocker, that extra that plus three plus three isn't going to be pushed through as damage necessarily because they don't have trample, so they have to have they have mm-hmm. to choose to not block something or to not have a blocker. Now, what does surprise me is not having more pyroclasms in here. I don't understand why there's only one. Yeah. Because it was Although such an I effective maybe card it's just in the not... format. I'm sorry, what? It was such an effective card in the format. Yeah. I guess maybe it's just not so central to the, to this deck's idea. I don't know. Because he's, he has other removal options also. So, yeah. yeah. So, I don't know off the top of my head exactly what I would add in it instead of the baubles. So maybe they are better to to add than I realize. I, I might even just throw in a, I would just throw in another creature. Like why not another one drop creature? Mm-hmm. I don't know that there was a good two drop in this format in these colors. I don't see any here, and I can't think of any again off the top of my head. But he could throw in more more gorilla shots. Another mm-hmm. one one for one with a special ability. You may or may not want to activate. Yeah. Could potentially push through more damage just with early attack. He does have two pyroclasms in the sideboard. So I guess, oh, okay. you know, they come in. They okay. can come in now that I see that. That might make sense because, you know, you, you might need the uh, the targeted removal if you're not sure if you're going to come up against big creatures in the deck. And then when you realize you're playing a weenie deck, you can sub in the pyroclasms. Yeah, yeah. Because they get rid of any pup knights. Yeah, so I guess you don't necessarily know what you're playing. But as soon as you find out you're playing somebody who's running like Ice Age Pump Knights in black or white, then the pyroclasms come in. That's the most obvious thing I think you would use it for. Another quote. I saw this quote on MTG Goldfish. Uh, It was Jason Vorthos had posted this deck list on MTG Goldfish. I've talked before about he's, he's Jason Vorthos on Twitter too. I think He's at order of the Ebon hand, Jason Vorthos on Twitter. No, I think he's at Jason Vorthos on Twitter. And he's order of the Ebon hand. But I think his at is Jason Eben. Vorthos. What do you mean Ebon? I always say Ebon. I don't know, Alex. Does it matter? Is it is it a real word? It's like ebony. Is e- Eben a real word? Uh, is it a valid? I just assumed it was. Abbreviation of uh, ebony? I like Ebon. It sounds uh, Ebon. novel. I'm, I'm looking this up real quick. It says dark brown or black, semicolon, ebony. Okay. So it's essentially an alternative for ebony. Is that what you're telling yeah. me? Yeah. Initiate of the ebon hand, he is at Jason Vorthos on Twitter. But he posts a lot of deck lists, especially older deck lists on MTG Goldfish. And when you find one of his deck lists, it's the absolute best thing because at the bottom in the notes section, it's not just a brief like primer or explanation of the deck. There's usually a primer and then literally like 20 to 50 links to articles that have been written about the deck over the years or to old old, uh, message board posts. 
made by the people as they were building the deck or to old tournament reports written by people who were playing the deck at the time in different tournaments around the country. So his old posts are great. His MTG Goldfish posts are great. <clears throat> but there was this quote in reference to the bobble. According to Ole Rod on the Alice Facebook group, Urza's bobble was pure value and was never boarded out. So this is a card where I'm like, would I really even want to put this in here? It's a card that Ole Rod never took out of this deck. He found it to be quite valuable, pure value. He, I guess he wanted it in for the concentration, wanted it in for the card draw, never took it out. There's also a mention of Vexing uh, Arcanics. I remember the name of this card, but I don't remember what it does. I have one. It's literally just set him. It's one of the cards I kept all these years because it was a rare. Uh, when I told my mom I was in college, might have been in post. It might have been when I was at post doc. I was finally like, just throw them out. She was like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, okay. You're crazy. crazy uh, but she did dig through and like look all the cards up and keep the rares. I didn't say throw everything out. There was some stuff I didn't want to throw out, but there was a separate, there was another box. Where I was like, I don't think I want anything in there. And she did go through it and find the rares. That was the box where rares like Vexing Arcanics were. So I have a Vexing Arcanics from back in the day I don't think I ever played. Uh, this is a card that I never had any use for. It's four colorless artifact. You pay three colorless and tap. Target player names a card and then turns over the top card of his or her library. If that is the card named, you put it into the player's hand. Otherwise, put it into the player's graveyard and Vexing Arcanix deals two damage to that player. He said the plan with his Vexing was to take it in against control decks like Counterpost. So he would bring this in against a control deck, a slow control deck. Why is that again? If this is the card name, to put it into player's hand. Otherwise, Tar so target player names a card. That can be you, right? You can target yourself with this, I'm assuming. Yeah. But you would turn over your his or her library. You wouldn't want to do that. Okay, here's here's what I think you do against a, car, a deck that plays a slow game. Like a counter post deck. You bring this in to try to use it to, to do repeated, slow repeated damage. Yeah, so that they can't counter because it's an, it's an effect. Yes, you would say to the control player, okay, you would pay three, you would tap it to the control player, you would say, okay, name a card. Uh, and then you would hope that they wouldn't name the right card, which yep. most of the time they wouldn't because the counter post players in Ice Age Alliances didn't have a lot of ways to order their library. Yeah. Uh, they would name the wrong card and you'd deal two damage to them. And yes, if you got the Arcanix on the board, once it was there, they couldn't counter it. They would have to clear it off the board. Another thing it does, a little more minor maybe, is that it... So, Urza's Bauble does give you some, like, reconnaissance as to, like, what's in their hand, you know, which mm -hmm. isn't useless. Um, and then this kind of does the same thing because if you don't know what they're playing yet and they have to name a card... Well, they're going to name a card that's in their deck. So they're basically just telling you something that's in their deck that they're hoping for or might be coming. That's um, true. And then if it is the card that they draw, you know, I mean, you obviously don't want that, but you know what card it is now. So if they got like a counter spell, you know it's in their hand. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So playing against a counter deck, it might give you a heads up as to like which counter spells they're playing. And maybe not a big deal in this format because it's pretty restricted, but you know, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Gives you a little bit of info. Probably it's definitely mostly for the direct damage though, right? The direct damage potential. It's like a it's like a worse version of uh curse scroll almost. It's like an early yeah. That's what I'm thinking yeah. mostly is how they're using it. The one thing I think you're right though, you could use it on yourself to some advantage, right? Well, yeah, you could if you uh, if you had a way of putting a card on top of your deck like Urza, with Urza's ball, uh, Urza's. Uh, That's true. Yeah, you could look. What, you know, you can put That's, a land on top of it, and then using Vexing Arcanics to draw that land. That is probably why they're grouped together in this in this quote. While he doesn't specifically say, you know, 
I had the uh, Vexing Arcanix in, and sometimes I board it in because it has synergy with the Urza's Bobble. He boards it in for other reasons. It does have some synergies with the Urza's Bobble, Lone which Bobble. he never boards out. Right. Urza's Bobble, too. Oh, sorry. Urza's Bobble's look at your hand. So, yeah, never mind. Yeah. Lodestone Bobble. Yeah, you can get more, you can, you can uh, draw extra land. If you put those land back on top of your hand, you know it's going to be a land. Sorry. If you put, those land back on top of your library, you know that yeah. your library has four lands on top. You can use the Vexian Arcanics to then draw them faster. Yeah. You won't have to go four turns without drawing something other than the land. That's the main deck. We started to get a little bit into the sideboard already. The sideboard has one Anarchy. What do you bring that in for? White Weenie. Mono white decks. Pyroblast, why do you bring that in? Blue decks. Always always board some pyroblast. More pyroclasms, probably for weenies. Vexing Arcanics, we just talked about. Zern Orb and Jokohops, one of here. Jester's Cap, one of. Probably you bring this in against certain combo decks. You just want to get rid of combo pieces. I guess. Monsoon. There wasn't a lot of great like color hate in Ice Age, so you were left with cards like Monsoon, which is two colorless, one red, one green. Enchantment, whenever any island is untapped at the end of its controller's turn, tap it. Monsoon deals one damage to that player. That's actually not bad. No, it's pretty good. You I, know, I forgot play. that uh I forgot that it forced them to tap untapped islands. Yeah. Primitive justice. I like Primitive Justice. We talked about this uh, two episodes ago. One colorless, one red, destroy target artifact. Destroy target artifact for each one colorless, one red you pay in addition to the casting cost. Or destroy target artifact and gain one life for each one colorless, one green you pay in addition to the casting cost. So you can use it to clear multiple artifacts off the board. Icy manipulators, because why not? I don't know why you bring in an icy. Sometimes I just want an icy. Sometimes your opponent has like a creature that you just can't deal with, with, with your current toolbox. So you bring in the icy. Mm -hmm. This was also the era where you could also tap certain artifacts with the icy. Yeah. And then they wouldn't work. Uh, essence filter. I don't remember essence filter. I remember that. I remember the art, but I don't remember what it does. It's one colorless, two green, sorcery. Destroy all enchantments or destroy all non-white enchantments. Okay. So, yeah. There's always going to be some deck running around that's full of enchantments that are a huge pain in the ass. So it's nice to have something like this. Mm -hmm. Get rid of them. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like the deck. Finally, the deck... I said there were some peculiarities about the deck. It runs 61 cards. Oh, nice. This is a 61 carder. You would think with like two lodestone bobbles and four orges bobbles, it wouldn't have to be a 61 carder, but it is. Yeah. Huh. It also runs just 18 lands, which I didn't notice until it was pointed out in an article that I was reading. And I'm like, that's right. It does run 18 lands. That's weird, man. I would expect that would lead to like a lot more mana screwing that I would want to deal with. But it makes do. You mostly just have three casting cost, like one to three casting cost spells. And you have your baubles, which is zero casting cost. Yeah. And you'll draw from from the baubles. Right. And you have mana elves, so that helps a little. And you have mana elves. But still, like 18 seems kind of scary. It's like, it's really borderline. Yeah. But this deck, this deck won Pro Tour Columbus 1996. And it did so by beating the next deck we're going to talk about. If there's not anything else you want to say about Red Green nope. Bug Bind, Alex. Nope. Now we're going to take a look at the deck that he beat in the finals in 1996 in Columbus. The number two deck. It is Four Color Control by Sean Fleischman. The four colors are White, Red, black blue no green let's start again with the creatures 
There are four creatures in this deck. So you have 21 creatures versus four creatures. These are dastardly little creatures, though. These are real son of a bitches. They're difficult to get rid of. They are two blinking spirits and two ivory gargoyles. So the blinking spirit is three colorless, one white. Pay zero mana. Return blinking spirit to owner's hand. It's a 2-2. It looks like it should fly. It doesn't fly, though. Ivory Gargoyles, we talked about last episode. Four colorless, mm -hmm. one white, 2-2 two, two flying. This looks like it should fly. It does fly. If Ivory Gargoyle is put into your graveyard from play, put it into play under owner's control at end of turn. Skip your next draw phase. You could pay four colorless and one white to remove Ivory Gargoyle from the game. This last episode, Alex, is a card you said you overlooked, but you started to warm up to it once we came back to it and looked at it again. Yeah, yeah. This deck does not aim to overwhelm opponents' removal with a horde of creatures the way Ole's deck did. It just aims to consistently recur a few pesky creatures. It is still how you kill your opponent, though. You, he, he kills with these creatures. Or with uh, creatures generated by Keldoran Outpost, which we will get to. Oh, okay, yeah, he's the Outpost, too, so that helps. Also, yeah. there's Incinerate, so it could finish someone off that way. He could finish. You're not going yeah, to... take your point. It's probably Three Incinerates, good. he can do a max of nine damage. So yeah. the, these, these guys need to do a little something. A little something, something. Yeah. Sorceries and Instants. There's a lot of Sorceries and Instants in this deck. Eight Sorceries, 18 Instants. What do we see here? We see the two best wipes in the format again. We saw them in Ole Rod's deck. We see them here to deal with the opposing hordes. You have two Jokel Hopses and two Pyroclasms main board. And then when I look at this deck, it looks to me like a uh, control good stuff deck. Control, control deck. What are the good control cards in this format? I'm going to build a deck around them. It's a good stuff. In black, you have Hand Disruption. Mind Warp. This is a, a neutered Mind Twist or a fair Mind Twist. <laughs> yeah. Three colorless, one black, X, Sorcery. Look at target player's hand and choose X cards. That player then discards those cards. If the player does not have enough cards in hand, his or her entire hand is discarded. So it's hard to use this card to like make your opponent discard their entire hand on turn one or turn two right. like some but people you can take the two cards you want the most out of their hand you could which is not too bad so it's a fair mind twist it's actually I always really... passed i you know i always ignored this card i'm not that i saw it a ton but i you know ignored this card because of the casting cost but being able to choose you know you might be able to get some mileage out of this yeah it's not bad it's just bad in comparison to things that came before it yeah that were then either restricted or sometimes outright banned in many different formats. Mind Warp, I'm pretty sure, has never been restricted or banned. Uh, land Disruption. So there's Hand Disruption in the form of Mind Warp. You have now Land Disruption in the form of Stone Rain. You have Direct Damage running three Incinerates. Two Stone Rain, three Incinerates. You have white removal. This is why I always, well, one of the main reasons I always ran white in almost every deck that I built back in the yeah. day, because I would want to run Swords to Plush Shares and Disenchant. Exactly, yep. And yep. he has three Swords to Plush Shares and three Disenchants. And then if you're building a control good stuff deck, what's the good stuff for control in blue? Well, it's counter spells. So he runs three counter spells, three power sinks, and then because you have alliances available to you, two Force of Wills. Okay. Probably uh, a lower number because he doesn't have as many blue cards in the deck. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say if he had more blue cards in his deck, you'd definitely have more Force of Wills. But how many cards do you have in this deck that you can pitch to Force of Will? you got your three counter spells, your three power sinks, so six, and then you have one Limdol's Vault, so seven. Yeah. So you probably don't want to run more than two Force of Wills. Um. I just want to take a second to gush about Power Sync. This was always a card that I really liked uh, a long time ago. Um, you had 
not too many, you know, very few options for alternate counter spells that were easier to cast. Um, and so without having to pay the two blue, you get to counter something for one blue and some mana. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, you have to pay the X, but a lot of the time the thing they're casting that you want to counter is tapping them out or almost tapping them out anyways. Yeah. Uh, you know. So I just always thought this was a, like a, a fun and interesting card that, that maybe got overlooked sometimes back then. Yeah, I almost never played it. I don't know if I ever played it. And it's definitely something that I probably should play sometimes. Probably should have been in some of my decks. Uh, it can definitely be used as a one blue, one colorless counter a lot of the times. Yeah. If it's early enough in the game, especially. Yeah. I think it's a card that uh, yeah, a lot of the times I'll see a card and maybe think it's good. And then once I play with it, I'm unimpressed. This kind of card, this card kind of goes the other way. Like, not sure if it would work initially, but when I've used it, it like was successful many times. Mm -hmm. And then you got your Lim Dole's Vault, which we talked about last episode, I believe. One blue, one black, instant. Look at the top five cards of your library. As many times as you choose, you may pay one life to put those cards on the bottom of your library and look at the top five cards of your library. Shuffle all but the top five cards of your library. Put those five on top of your library in any order. Effects that prevent or redirect damage cannot be used to counter this loss of life. You play the Limdol's Vault when you really want something. When there's one card in particular you really want to get, you cast that Limdol's Vault. So we've got ourselves a four-color good stuff deck of the control variety. Artifacts. There's only one artifact. It is a Zuran Orb. You see that a lot in this era. People just yeah. put in a Zurin Orb. It's good. Especially if you're running a slower kind of deck like this, too. Well, anytime you have Joko Hops, it's good. Because you yeah. could always cast your Joko Hops, and then the lanes are going anyway, so you might as well gain, uh, you know, four, five, six. Let's say you're going to at least have five lands out and a Manimal or something. So you might as well gain ten life when you blow all the lands up. It's also good for a control deck, because... If you're facing an aggro deck, you get a slow start. Yeah. The Zuran Orb can help you survive until you really establish your position. Considering that, like, this Ice Age format is maybe kind of slow, you know, the life mm -hmm. gain effect might be, how should I put this, like, like by comparison, somewhat strong. Like, we know life gain isn't great, you know, usually, but in, like, the Ice Age format, it might be strong enough to keep you alive. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah, because if you gain four life or six life once, although a lot of times it's not going to buy you all that much extra time. But in a slower format, that can that can get you multiple turns to stay on the board. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, if the creatures you're up against are, you know, you're outnumbered, but they're like underwhelming creatures, you know? There's no 12-12 coming your way yet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's a woolly spider coming at you. Another thing that I thought was interesting, like th this was sort of a deck building like kind of thing for me, like, you know, like one Zuran Orb back then. Um, back, you know, Demonic Tutor was legal around this time uh, in, in the formats we'd played. So it was kind of like, you know, one Demonic Tutor was an auto-include. And I wonder mm -hmm. if that's the thinking that goes into like the one Limdul's Vault. It's just kind of like taking the tutor slot. It seems like it, yeah. Yeah, because... Because there's nothing, like, this deck doesn't depend on a Limdol's Vault. It's not like a combo deck where you want to put in four no, Limdol's no. Vault to I think it's get just your like combos. A, a tutor effect for your, yeah, like, yeah. see what's coming up next and get the counterspell you want or whatever. Um, yeah. And then the lands. There's 30 lands. This is way different than the 18 lands we saw in the last deck. Whoa. But, you know, you see that with control decks. Land count's usually higher. Also, two of these lands are killed on outposts, so this is another way to pump out creatures, and this is uh, one of the replacement lands, so you put out yeah. the Keldor on outpost, you have to sacrifice the planes or you bury it. Right. Uh, you're also going to be wanting to cast your spells, plus when you have an outpost out, you're going to be wanting to generate those soldier tokens, paying one colorless and one white and tapping it to put a soldier token out in play, so you're going to want more lands out in play. And you have your Thawing Glaciers, three Thawing Glaciers that he runs in this deck to get those basic lands to slowly build up a big mana base so you can generate soldier tokens and on the same turn be playing whatever spells you want to play. 
So now I'm maybe seeing like the Zurin orb, like that's the other thing too. Yeah, you have all these extra lands for it. You know, obviously that helps. Like, um, but since you're using these like pesky creatures, you have these little one ones from the outposts, and you have your blinking spirit and ivory gargoyle. You don't really want to be using them as blockers and losing them. I mean, I know the blinking spirit comes back, the ivory gargoyle comes back, but like, uh, you want to be using them to attack to get their damage in. So. Once you have those down, you can just keep attacking with them and use the Zuron Orb and the lands like as your blockers. You know what I mean to to absorb that damage while you're finishing the opponent off with your attacks. Yeah, you don't have to worry about keeping a blocker untapped. Yeah. You can thank you attack. for saying that more concisely. <laughs> you can attack and then accept the damage that your opponent's gonna direct towards you next turn to four damage and just sack lands to it. Yeah, and then you can use to your break even to deal damage. Uh, other thing about the thawing glaciers is it's great. We talked about this. You know, it helped. Uh, it made it easier to play multicolored decks. So this is a four color deck. You're going to want to have your your thawing glaciers in there to help cast your four colors. What else do I want to say? That's about it. I think the. I mean, the game plan here is to counter to to counter and destroy. Eventually, overwhelm with the glaciers, the outpost, and the recurring creatures. If needed, you can reset the board with hops. Then you can probably recover from the Jokel hops faster than your opponent using your recurring creatures, using your 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 thawing glaciers. Essentially, the deck is designed to have more answers than your opponent has threats. And the ability to recur some of these things or to generate to bring out multiple lands with one, to generate multiple creatures from one land, it helps you have more answers than your opponent has threats. I like having lots of answers like that in a deck, having like a deck that's lots of removal yeah. and, yeah. But, you know, this particular match, Ole Spider deck had too many threats for his answers. And Fleischman got gargoyly screwed <laughs> with this ivory gargoyle. Let no. me read something from InQuest Magazine. Uh, Alex, I, I I teased you last week. I said I had a good ivory gargoyle pun and it was coming at you next episode. That was it. I forgot. Fleischman, Fleischman got gargoyly screwed. Let me read this little quote. This was from an article written by Beth Morsund. Pro Tour 3, InQuest Magazine, issue 17, pages 76 to 77. Rod and Fleischman faced each other for the championship. The first two games were over quickly, and it looked like Rod might repeat his sweep. Fleischman came back to win the third. So Rod was up 2-1. In the fourth duel, Fleischman managed to get an ivory gargoyle in play and cast Joko Hops. That's the kind of thing you want. You want that setup. Things were looking grim for Rod. He says, I panicked, and I threw two cards at him with the Stormbind. He went, ah! He paid four mana, throw two cards, do four damage. And luckily, he didn't draw the Fintorn Elves. Because if he had them already, he would have, I think he's, what he's saying is, I would have I sacked him to the Stormbind to just do damage. I wouldn't have had the Elf. I wanted to kept the Elf. Then she goes on to say, the Gargoyle beat on Rod until he got out a land and an Elf. So he was taking two from the Gargoyle. He eventually drew a land. He eventually drew an Elf. That gives him two mana. Then suddenly, Fleischman found himself caught in a trap of his own making as Rod began to stormbind the gargoyles during each upkeep. So he had his two mana to pay for the stormbind effect, pitch a card, do two damage to the gargoyle. The gargoyle would go to the graveyard from play, and then it would be put into play under owner's control at the end of turn and skip his next draw phase. So every turn, Rod was stormbinding the gargoyle, and Fleischman was losing his next draw. Yeah. So I'll read that again. Then suddenly, Fleischman found himself caught in a trap of his own making as Rod began to stormbind the gargoyles during each upkeep, preventing him from attacking or drawing cards. It was like infinite time walks, was Rod's gleeful description. So he got gargoyly screwed. <laughs> and that's yeah, how I, mean, I guess that is the downside to this and that's why they put that uh, ability on the gargoyle so you can get yourself out of it but 
if you do it after a joke lock, a joke you're lock. Not have the five it's, mana. It's so. hard to get out. So yeah, he got Ivory Gargoyle locked. <laughs> and that's how he lost that's how he lost the game four of the proto. Sort of makes you think that, that would have happened like before that. I mean, maybe it did, but it wasn't enough to lose the you know, the series of games against someone or something. Yeah, it had it had to have happened sometimes, but Yeah. Yeah. You know. That's funny. Cause so with the Stormbind, like he's not really drawing a card either because he's pitching a card every turn, but he's drawing one. And then as long as he already had two cards in his hand, then he has like, you know, a chance to still be getting a new card exactly when he throws away. You can start doing that once you have your land and your elf and two cards in your hand. Yeah. Then you can pitch the one card, get a fresh yeah. card. Have it have it have the next card to pitch, get a fresh card. So yeah, you just need to last a certain amount of turns. And then when you have that combo of stuff down, you're good to go. And uh well, that's cool. Joko hops, you 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 see you bury all artifacts, creatures, and lands. It doesn't bury enchantments. So maybe the mistake here was Joko hopsing when the stormbind was down. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So the storm oh, it was already down when he joke hopsed. I don't know that for a fact. I haven't watched the video. It is on YouTube. But it sounds it, like it. Oh yeah, it sounds he like he panicked, it right? And sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, he did say that. Oh, he God. panicked. So he, he, yeah. Interesting. Anyways. So those are the decks that I wanted to talk about uh from back in the day from alliances and ice age constructed format you need to see what people were doing with the with the format that was the format of pro tour columbus 1996 i want to talk a little bit about what people are doing these days with uh ice age alliances constructed in segment two i want to talk a little bit about the alice format this is a current day alliances ice age constructed format you can't travel back to 1996 to play your Alliances Ice Age, but you can still party like it's 1996 by playing the Alice format, Alex. <laughs> what is Alice format? Well, you can look it up here on uh, mtgoldframe.com. They have a list of all bunch of different old frame formats. This is an old frame format you can play on a budget. Deck construction rules, 60 card decks, allowed sets. Ice Age and Alliances only. It's essentially Alliances Ice Age block constructed without homelands. Very, I mean, exactly what the 1996 Pro Tour Columbus format was. Alliances Ice Age only. Rules, contemporary rules and errata are followed. Banned and restricted cards. The only banned card is Amulet of Quas, which nobody wanted to play anyways. I believe that's an anti-card. There's no restricted cards. So if you want to play more Necros, here's your chance. <laughs> they have uh, uh, images of a bunch of different decks that people have played. Actually, here, sorry. They just have one one deck here. Maxime, God, Godbout, the Herbros. I uh, butchered that. Okay. Name. Winning deck at the Alice Quebec Classic, number one. Black, white deck. We see our gestures cap we see our thawing glaciers we see a black deck with no necro we see a demonic consultation we see an ivory gargoyle which we just talked about mm -hmm. dances of the dead pox i want to show one deck in particular that i found here uh well not here i didn't find it on this i didn't find it on this website but it is an alice deck it's a recent alice deck I snipped this deck list from the Ice Age Discord. This is a Discord where they talk about Alice. So you can head to the Ice Age Discord. You can see what kind of decks they're building. They have monthly tournaments, not monthly tournaments. They have tournaments that they play from time to time. I don't know if they're monthly or bi-monthly or whatever. I don't think they're monthly. But this deck won a recent tournament. It was the winning deck of Ice Age 29. So they've held 29 of these tournaments. And I believe... Their webcam tournament. So if you wanted to get on a, in on this, you don't have to do it in person with this group of people. You can join the webcam tournament. It is a mono white deck, or almost, they say, because there's one blue card in the sideboard. But it's essentially a mono white deck. 
called Geldor's Fortifications. The deck went, it says 5-0 and then in parentheses it says 10-0. It's the third iteration. Last two did not perform. Hydra Blasts are necessary. So as this deck was evolving, they must have added the two islands and uh, sideboarded in the Hydra Blasts. Celestial Sword should have been a fourth Skull Catapult. I wouldn't change much more. You might say, what the hell is a Celestial Sword? What is a Skull Catapult? We will cover that. Let's start with the creatures, which is where I've been starting with these decks. Twelve creatures in Keldor's Fortifications. We see four Ivory Gargoyles. Four Order of the White Shield, which is a nice Pump Knight from Ice Age. It's two white, two one. Summon Knights. Protection from Black which is always useful. It's especially useful in a meta where you have a lot of Necro decks running around, mono black decks running around. You're also going to be facing a lot of black pump knights, so it's good to have a pro black pump knight to come back at them with. You can pay one white to give it first strike until end of turn. You can pay two white to give it plus one plus zero until end of turn. Then the remaining four creatures are actually a wall. Walking wall for four colorless. It's zero six. It counts as a wall. It's an artifact creature. You can pay three colorless. Walking Wall gets plus three, minus one until end of turn. It can attack this turn. Walking Wall cannot attack the turn it comes under your control. Use this ability only once each turn. So as far as walls go, this ain't a terrible one. It, it is not. Go three I'm actually, this is interesting because I I feel like I, like I remember this card existing, sort of like what it does and the name of it, but not the specifics. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's good enough that people should have been using it back, back then. Uh and it's I don't remember ever seeing people bad. do that. It's not bad. It's mana intensive, but, you know, this is a yeah. format where a lot of things are slow and mana intensive. But yeah, it's okay. It's, you know, for, for what people pay for, you know, the damage they can get out of, like, Cursed Scroll or, or you know, uh, those sorts of cards where, like, when you have things going your way later in the game and you have mana to spare to, like, pump into something, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's not too bad. Plus, the art's kind of cool. The art is cool. Uh, and it's, I mean, this is a defensive style deck. We're going to go through the rest of the deck. This is largely a defensive deck, and this is a good defensive card. Six toughness. That's going to, I mean, that's going to block just about anything that's going to be coming your way in Ice Age form. Yeah, and when it attacks, it only loses one to the toughness. So you have a 3-5. Yeah. A 3-5. Got it. The only shame is that he's sort of squandering the fact that it's four colorless playing it in a mostly white deck. Explain that. I'm not understanding. Oh, like it's not a big deal at all. It doesn't make the card worse. I'm just saying that, like, since it's a colorless card, it would be, you know, a fine addition to a, a three color deck or a. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, but in here, it doesn't really, he's not making use of that advantage of the card because it's a, a mono white deck mostly. Okay. Instance. He runs the best white removal four swords to plowshares, two disenchants. Obviously, this he didn't feel like this was enough creature removal, so he added two exiles, which is an interesting card from card from alliances. Uh, two colorless, one white, instant, remove target non-white attacking creature from the game, gain life equal to that creature's toughness. I forgot then, about this until we brought it up a few weeks ago, and I'm tempted to try to use it. Yeah, it's not bad. I I had it in an early version of the pump the oh, commander okay. deck, uh, because you know commander. You're dealing with a uh, singleton format. I already put in my sword to plowshares. I was going to stick with the exile, but then I decided to go with reprisal instead, which is just one white, one colorless. You don't gain the life. Mm. Uh, and also, I think you can use it against any color creature, not just non-white creatures. But also, I think it only works against creatures for toughness or for power or, or above oh yeah 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 so it has different limitations is that i'm getting it confused with another card it's the same from time. alliances yeah I, I it has like the the poke and the big dragon and the one art yeah it has it has few different arts uh i think two of them might be poking the big dragon and the dragons are different colors and then one doesn't have them poking a dragon at all green monster yeah, very target creature with power four or greater. Power four or greater. So it doesn't have to be attacking, which is nice. One colorless, one white. Yeah. That's what I remember. 
Yeah, that's not a bad card. Not a bad card. I mean, if I could run two swords to plowshares, I would, but I can't. Yeah. And the pump is full of small creatures, so I'm like afraid of a big baddie. I was just trying to think like Right, right, yeah. You know, and 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 my bit I do have some big creatures in there too, but they're not flyers. So I was afraid of flyers too. That's weird. I don't know why. I don't know that I need to necessarily be afraid of flyers, but I am. And then he runs one scars of the veteran, which we didn't like, and we thought it added plus zero plus one counters to the creature that only lasts until the end of turn. In the last episode, we realized it says you put the plus zero plus one counters on that creature at the end of turn, but they don't go away at the end of the turn. Yeah. So they do so stay used there. to seeing things say until end of turn like that, that I think we, we were just like reading it that way. Yeah. So it's actually better than we thought. Better than we thought, but I refuse to change my mind. I still do believe that it is the worst <laughs> of the pitch spells. I agree. But I am. We are seeing some people using it at this point, so may, you know, yeah, maybe I'll try it. I like those but, defensive surprise spells again. Giant growth, you know. I was. What was I going to say? Uh, I mean, it's not bad to use here because you just have two tough. I mean, with your pump knights. I mean, that's really good with a pump knight. I was trying to think. Your that's ivory true. gargoyle, it's just two toughness. You can make your ivory gargoyle a lot better, but then if that goes away when you recur it, then it comes back to two. But true. you can make a fat ass pump knight with the scars of the veteran. Yeah, that would be good with the pump knight. Yeah. Uh it wouldn't be bad with that walking wall either. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh those are the instants. It's pretty artifact heavy. It has two Zurin orbs. Oh, neat. Which we see because people just like Zarin Orp. It's a good card in this format. Two Ices, because this is a largely control deck. So Ices is a, is a great control card. It was back in the day. Now, you know, people don't like it so much because it's slow and it's a lot of mana for what it does. But back in the day, four mana and then one mana and tap to activate to tap anything is good, in a, especially in a control deck. Now, this is where it gets sweet. I'll start with the Celestial Sword because he said that he wouldn't keep it in next time. Celestial Sword should have been a fourth scroll catapult. I didn't remember this card at all. Talk about mana intensive. It's intensive. It's six mana, six colorless. Artifact, you pay three colorless and tap it. Target creature you control gets plus three, plus three until end of turn. At end of turn, bury that creature. So Ugh. I guess what you're doing here is you're using it to make your gargoyle five, two, and then you bury the gargoyle, but it comes back. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it's a lot of mana. And you really only want to use it against your gar on your gargoyle because you wouldn't want to use it on your pump knight or your wall because they're not coming back. You could use it with a soldier token. I'm going to skip yeah, ahead I was a little bit to the lands. Tokens too, yeah. uh, the lands are 26 lands, four Adakar Waste. That's the blue white pain land. Two islands, 14 plains, four thawing glaciers. To go get all those basics. And then you have two Keldron outposts. You can use these to pump out plus uh one 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 soldier tokens. You can use your celestial sword to make them four one, which is actually kind of nice. No, sorry, four four. It's plus three plus three. So that is nice. That was probably his thought there. You know, I'm gonna be pumping out a lot of one ones. Uh why not pay three mana from time to time to make one of them a four four? could deal with a bigger creature if it needs to block. I could also use it to push through extra damage. Not terrible. It's just that it costs six to get out in the first place. Yeah, it's the initial summoning cost. Like, yeesh. With no ramp. You have no ramp here. Yeah. Uh, so Icy Manipulators, everybody knows what that does. This is a card that I was reminded of recently by looking when I saw this deck and I was like, I like this card. Pit Trap, two colorless. Artifact. You pay two colors and you tap it to sacrifice, and then you sacrifice Pit Trap to bury target creature without flying that is attacking you. I like that. Yeah, we just talked about it, and I I certainly remember the art from that card, uh, but I feel like I overlooked it, and it's probably worth a second look. It's not too bad. Yeah, and it's you know more creature removal. I think that's this is a control deck. You have creatures like the Ivory Gargoyle that can come back. You can use them to block if they die. They can come back. 
Uh, you have source to plowshares to get rid of their creatures. You have exile to get rid of their creatures. You have the outpost to generate one ones that you can use to block. Pit trap is more creature removal. So if people are coming at you with creatures, which a lot of people in Ice Age format are doing, Ice Age Alliances format, there's a lot of creature based decks. You've got to have a lot of ways to deal with them. The pit trap is one more way to deal with them. Mm-hmm. And you know some of these ways, like generating soldier tokens or ivory gargoyles, it's chump locking. Well, you don't want to chump lock forever. Sometimes that gets to be difficult. You have to keep putting more resources into generating more chumps. The pit trap just gets rid of them. And it's nice because it uh, it doesn't have like a color limitation like the way the exile does. Yeah. What's yeah. it called again? Is it called exile? It is called exile. Yeah. Okay, that's confusing because the me- mechanic is called exile too. Yes. Um, but yeah, it it do- it doesn't have like a color limitation on it, which is nice. Uh. It would actually probably be pretty good maybe like in a deck where like you have like nothing but black removal and you can't get rid of black or artifact creatures, you know? Uh, so throw that in a mono black might be cool. And I feel like it's kind of taken the place of like uh, quicksand. Like if quicksand was around, it would go in this deck probably. Um, and this is like, a, I don't know if, if people prefer quicksand now a days. Now a day. I don't know. I don't know. Compared to that. Uh, because I do see quicksand in more decks, but I never see pit trap in decks. Yeah, but I'm always thinking about the friggin' uh, Phyrexian Dreadnought because it's such a good deck in uh, pre-modern. True, that's a good call. And I'm always like, do I want to? Here's the problem: I'm always thinking about the Dreadnought, so I end up with decks with like 16 cards to kill the Dreadnought, but the deck doesn't do anything <laughs> else. <laughs> so I'm like, do I want to sideboard pit traps into certain decks? Yeah. Uh maybe for decks where I don't have green or white. Maybe I, I can sideboard I mean, in pit traps. I could eat up your dreadnought. Ball with the dreadnought, it would work well. I could do a turn three. I can have that pit trap out. I could pit trap your dreadnought. Yeah. It seems like the pit trap wouldn't work on a dreadnought, but it would. I mean, like mechanically it does, but like in <laughs> If the dreadnought was real, you would feel like the pit trap would not work on what that thing is. Would get stuck in it, like it could get stuck. Like get hurt too much would be like. Yeah, it wouldn't get hurt, but it just maybe kind of work its way out. Yeah. <laughs> it's also really brutal art. Like it is good art, very but... brutal art. But what I was saying is, this is removal. This is to actually get rid of a creature because you don't want to necessarily use your chumps like Kyodoran Outpost or Ivory Gargoyle to continuously chump block because you want to be doing something else with the Ivory Gargoyle that's recurring or with the soldiers yeah. you're generating. And what you want to be doing with these soldiers and the Gargoyle is catapulting them at your opponent's face with the Skull Catapult. Excellent. So that's the other artifact he has in the here. It is four colorless artifact you pay one colorless and tap sacrifice a creature to have skull catapult deal two damage to target creature or a player it's even better it's like it's great that you could do it to both creature or player because you can use it as removal get your opponents uh two toughness creatures or let's say three toughness creatures if you uh block with a soldier token and then do two extra damage or four toughness creatures if you block with a ivory gargoyle and then you skull catapult. Or more toughness creatures if you block with a pump knight and you pump the knight and then you skull catapult. You know, so you can go through all of those uh, potential outcomes. Yeah, what well, I was if there was another outcome that I could think of right now. Oh. I said two, I said I said two, three, four or more. So I'll just stop there. Cause I could go higher with the celestial sword, give plus three plus three to something else you know yeah the people have had enough but you get the point the skull catapult so this Uh, seems like skull catapult plus outpost or ivory gargoyle seems like exactly the sort of janky combo i would like come up with and find it to be like too clunky to work (laughs) well alex it won uh ice age uh 29 yeah that's crazy so this is you got to get into ice age alliances format because this is this is up your alley i guess that's my playground yeah (laughs) I like it, especially with the Ivory Gargoyle. That's nice. Once you get this down on the Ivory Gargoyle, you can use it every turn. I haven't seen this deck in action, but just looking at it, I'm assuming that's this is the main this is the main finisher, the Skull Catapult, with the recurring Ivory, Ivory Gargoyle and the Soldier Tokens. You use a lot of this 
control spells to handle the things your opponent's putting down, and then you skull catapult the gargoyle and the tokens at them. That's what mm -hmm. I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Also uses, I really love this, in combination with the skull catapult, a card that I thought about putting in my commander deck. It hasn't made it in yet, though. Inheritance. Oh. One white enchantment. We talked about this last episode, too, I think. You can then play three colors to draw a card. But you use this ability only when a creature is put into the graveyard from play and only once for each creature put into the graveyard. But if you're regularly sacrificing your own creatures to the Skull Catapult, you can mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. sacking a 1-1 one, one token and drawing a card. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty nice card draw Yeah, in this deck. Not bad. So I like this deck a lot. This is something I found on the Ice Age Discord. If you're interested in the Alice format, look into joining the Ice Age Discord. This is Kjeldor's Fortifications, a deck that I would like to play. We're going to move on. We're going to go to the next segment. We were going to talk about the Winter Super Drop 2024, but I don't think we have time. We're running out of time today. So I think we're going to skip that in this episode. We might do a mini episode later in the week where we where we cover the Winter Super Drop 2024. I'm going to move ahead to the last episode of, no, sorry, the last segment of episode 76 of the Old Mage MTG podcast. It's the last segment of pretty much every episode of the Old Mage MTG podcast. It is the Commander Corner, the Old Mage Commander Corner. In this segment, sometimes we learn about Commander. We talk about some Commander rules we're learning about. We cover some interesting Commander articles we saw. If we don't have any of those things to talk about, we build a Commander deck. That's what we're doing today. Last year, Alex and I built our first Commander decks. They were all old frame Commander decks. Mine was an Angro creature-based Commander deck called The Pump. Alex's was a Group Hug Commander deck called Group Mud. This year, I'm so far sticking with the old frame theme. I might break it. I might add a couple new frame cards in. I haven't decided. But this year, I'm going old frame with Atogs. My commander being Atogatog. So it's a five color deck. The deck is called A Deck A Deck. It is still in progress. This is my lineup so far. I have eight creatures. They are all Atogs. There are 12 total Atogs in Magic, I think. Not many. 11 of them are old frame. Megatog is not old frame. I got two artifacts. I got three enchantments. I've added these because they're food for my Atogs. I've got the dual lands, even though I don't really own them. I'm putting them here on Moxfield right now. I own three dual lands. I don't own the others. I might switch these out. The ones I don't own, I might get rid of them. I might add like a tap land or something. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I have one forest in here so far. I added the one forest because it is food for my four talk. I might add other forests. But not today. Today I'm going to add a couple spells. This Atog deck, Atog Atog, for me, the way I'm building it, it's all about going out in a blaze of glory. I'm going to go big. I'm going to try to establish a board and then one or two crazy plays. I'm going to gobble up everything I got and I'm going to the face. So there's two cards that I wanted to add. If I'm trying to build a deck where I'm going crazy, I'm going out in a blaze of glory. One of those cards is Berserk. This was in the pump. My 2023 commander deck. It's also going to be in a deck of deck, my 2024 commander deck. Why is this? I have an unlimited copy of Berserk. I like the idea of making my Atogatog really big and then Berserking it to double up. I like the idea of doing that with any of these Atogs, really. I like the idea of rancoring up an Atog. But then it already has Trample. But who cares? I can still use Berserk to double its power. I can sacrifice artifacts or enchantments to give these plus one, plus one, plus two, plus, plus two, plus two, whatever. Berserk it. Double it up. You get double the value for everything you've eaten. 
Also, not all of these have uh, trample, so this gives it trample, so I can push through that damage. Make sure I get some damage done if I'm going to sacrifice things to the Atox. Uh, the other thing I'm going to add is another card that's great when you're making things big. So Berserk is great because it doubles the power, plus it gives it trample. It's already big. It helps you push all that damage through. Another card is Fling. If I'm going to eat up all my shit, make an Atog really big, I'll fling it at your face. Let's say I can't trample through. It's getting flung. There you go. So I got two instants. The only downsides to these two cards is I can't feed them to any of my Atogs. There are zero Atogs that eat instants. That wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense. It's Not okay. that any of this makes sense, really. No, but that's okay. You, you don't have to have you get everything the point. like edible to Atogs in your deck. Exactly. You know, some instants, especially powerful ones, those are like game-winning instants. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. I go big. I also, can this can this work? Multiplayer game, like Commander. Can I eat a bunch of my stuff, make an Atog big, Berserk it, attack one player? And then, and then after it does the damage, it. can I fling it at another player, or is it dead before it can do that? Can I make die that from Berserk? It says at end of turn, so yeah, I don't see why not. Until end of turn, target creature's current power doubles, and it gains trample ability. If it attacks, target creature's destroyed at end of turn. It does the damage. There's like a final cleanup step, right? And this is where the basics of Magic the Gathering. I don't tell you. Remember, I play kind of on vibes. I don't really play based on the rules, really. It's like what how I'm feeling. <laughs> on the vibes. No, I don't see why not. You'd, you'd berserk, you'd attack, you'd deal the damage. I think you can, the right? The creature's still alive until the end of turn. That's how you... I see it. Yeah. Unless they've changed how berserk works. but that's what That's what I think I can do. So this is why I thought these would... I mean, they're both good cards on their own. And they're both good cards, especially when you're running decks that's, you know, based on creature damage. But I like the idea of potentially... Oh. Ah, oh, oh, damn it. it. What happened? Target... <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Target creature gains trample and plus X plus zero until end of turn where X is its power. At the beginning of the next end step, destroy that creature if it attacked this turn. At the beginning of next end step. Yeah, so instead of the end of turn, it's now the, the end step. So, so like damage won't resolve? The attack was over. So the damage won't resolve if I were to fling it. I could fling it still, but the damage wouldn't resolve. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking in order to get the damage, this is like, you know. Because damage doesn't go on a stack either. Right. Like if the damage go went on the stack, I would think that I would be able to berserk attack. The damage goes on the stack. I like that. That sounded good. Then I fling it at the next person. That person takes the fling damage. The damage on the stack from the first person I attacked resolves. They both get hit. It's possible that this was never legal. But now, from what you read, it sounds like it's definitely not legal now. Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe it was legal at one point. Yeah, but uh, yeah, they changed how Berserk works, I guess. Well, that being said, I'm still adding both cards because I still like them. I just can't oh, yeah. use... They don't have to work exactly together. They're still both totally useful. I just can't use them to uh, kill two opponents. Yeah. With How one is, big this is a really stupid spell. question now because I don't pl actually play commander with people uh, yet. Uh, how does attacking multiple opponents work? Does it happen simultaneously or does it happen like first one and then the other? I don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> I, and, and, uh, so we have We're to start done. playing commander. We have to start playing commander with other people. Uh, I would think that you could... I mean, you have an attack phase, so I would think that your attack phase, you you direct your attack. I think it would happen. You do it. Yeah, yeah. That's what that's what I always thought. I don't think you'd be able to like attack one player, like and then attack another player. No, I don't that think way so. you could do this berserk thing. You could pump up something, berserk, attack a guy, and then feed it to your atogatog, -atog and then attack that other guy yeah. or gal. I'm glad but you I'm said that because I because I was going to say or gal, Alex. We changed this from the old men magic podcast, the old mage MTG podcast, because we don't only play 
magic with men. Women play commander too. Glad you, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> it is true. Well, anyways. Uh, we're I'll, looking... I, I think we have like... I think we got one female viewer according to the analytics. <laughs> there has to change at some point. Yeah. Women do play magic together and I've seen it happen. Of course, of course. Yeah. But I think those are both good additions. Uh, I think they fit your deck very well. Flame is great because if they have a good blocker... That you can't get through, you can yeah. still pump one of your eight hogs and fling it. Yeah. Exactly. That's how I was thinking. I might need to get over or around blockers at some point. Yes. Yeah. This, this can help me get around some blockers or over some blockers. That's all I'm going to add this week. I, I, I've got some other ideas about some things. I think I want to add a clone. I can clone my favorite atog oh, i think good. i want to add some clan cards some uh things like coat of arms or shared triumph that give all creatures from one clan you know pluses i'm thinking about an enchantress but i don't have enough enchantments yet but i do want to i do want to add more enchantments to the deck you know mm -hmm. i'm like the enchantress is not an atog but if i'm going to run a deck with a lot of enchantments it's not bad to have an enchantress out sit there with her shroud and let me draw cards every time I uh, play an enchantment. Mm -hmm. If you have an enchantment out and you do the weird Rancor or Tog thing, you probably get to draw as many, do you get to draw as many cards as the times you play Rancor? I think you do. I have to think about that, but that would be sweet. Yeah, but uh, does Rancor go, but it goes back to your hand, right? And then you recast it? Enchanted creature gains plus zero plus two and trample when Rancor is put into a graveyard from play. Return it to its yeah. owner's hand and then oh, yeah. recast so you it. Yeah. Keep recasting that, and you draw a card every time you cast it. So I could potentially make one big attack towards an opponent with the Ortog Rancor combo, and at the same time, refill my hand. That'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about that. Just some stuff I'm thinking about. There's also that series of cards from uh, Judgment. Oh, they're all creatures though. If they're in your if they're in your graveyard, they give abilities. They bestow mm. abilities upon your uh okay. ab upon your creatures. Like wonder, for instance. If wonder's in your graveyard, it gives all your creatures flying. Yeah, or anger. Or anger. It gives all your creatures haste. But yeah, they're all creatures themselves. What I'm in the market for is an artifact or enchantment that bestows some ability upon your creatures if the artifact or enchantment is in the graveyard. I don't know if there are things like that. I don't know anything like that. But I'd be I'd be very interested because I could feed them to an ATOG and <laughs> then I lose it on the battlefield, but it now gives my ATOGs a special ability. I don't know if anything like that exists, though. I feel like everything that I know of that has an effect for being in the graveyard is a creature. That's all I can think of right now. But I don't know. I have to think about that some more. Okay, Alex, I don't know if you had any additions for your commander deck this week. I do. If you did. Okay. Okay, we'll go. Those are my I need additions. to catch up, so let me throw a few in. Berserk and Fling. Let's go back to Alex's deck, which is called, don't know how to pronounce this, Satan's, Satan's Power. Power. Satan's Power. Satan's Power. Yep. A Druid. Mono Green. Druid Clan deck. Centaur Druid Legend. Centaur Druid Clan. So far, your deck consists of Satan. Seton. We gotta figure out. I gotta figure out how to pronounce this name. Satan oh, just doesn't call it right Satan because that makes you know that's fun for my deck. Doesn't, my deck doesn't, doesn't, doesn't seem right call it now, right? Satan is my motor. That's a cake song. But it doesn't seem right, does it? No, it's probably Satan okay. or something. Satan. But how to pronounce. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see here. Oh, well, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Okay. I was just reminded the other day. We talked about during Homelands, we talked about either storm and we called it either storm. And then I was reminded like how early in the podcast and like episode seven, we had a whole episode where we sat around for like 20 minutes trying to figure out how to pronounce either. <laughs> and we were like, okay, it's definitely either. <laughs> 
and then like 50 <laughs> episodes yeah. later 50 episodes later we go back to aether storm anyways yep. <laughs> well steve since you brought that up okay. i have another pronunciation update for you and <sighs> you're not gonna like it <laughs> i don't it? like it either earlier in the podcast you said primer uh i learned some time are ago, you gonna tell me primer yeah i learned some time ago that technically it's supposed to be primer which i hate i don't understand why that would be the case it doesn't have two m's in it technically uh, according to who what are you talking about where's this coming from is this british pronunciation how it is because no, i don't live it's in an american thing too it's no, not it's even not. Like a... nobody says primer i know i know i think it should be primer and I think okay. we should continue to say primer because it, I mean, you prime something, right? If you're going to yeah. get it ready, you don't prim yeah. it. Well, I'm not even going to acknowledge this because okay. uh, I don't think this was a pronunciation error on my part. I've made multiple pronunciations already in errors in this episode. You have pointed out at least one. I have forgot it already. So I'll make the same error. Oh, Ebon. <laughs> <laughs> I will fix that one in the future unless I forget, which I probably will, but uh, I'm not going, I'm not. I, I think I'm with I'm, you. I'll, I'm, I'm not modifying just, the the way in which I just try to change it to primer, primer. and yeah. everyone else be damned. I mean, that's language is uh, constantly evolving. So uh, we can make it primer. True. Most of the America agrees with us. So everybody will just continue to say primer and that's what it will eventually become. Okay. Okay. All right, here's some cards for you. Okay. Get ready. Uh, oh, first I should probably say what, what I'm trying to do here, I guess. Um, so with this commander, I need druids, okay? Yep. Um, a lot of the druids are elves also. So one thing I've seen a, a few people talking about with druids is they're kind of like, ah, why well, play druids? Because you can just play elves and it's better. Mm -hmm. uh, but I uh, forget that. I mean, uh, we're going to make this work. Uh, do you get to play I, centaurs if you no, no. yeah right yeah. exactly yeah that's why and it's going to do something a little bit different than an elf deck would do i think in general but there's some overlap um and i'll be using some of the good elves uh let's see what else uh obviously tapping and untapping is going to be a big thing here um so i'm going to be want wanting to generate mana with repeated tapping of manimals and i'm going to be wanting to overwhelm my opponents with blockers and attackers that can do both and confuse them with how many available blockers and attackers I have. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like the way I'm looking at it. Mm -hmm. uh, so first, I'll try to start off with some of the boring stuff, I guess, just to catch up with you and fill in some of the the, the you know base level blocks. Um, let's add Llanowar Elves and Finhorn Elves, please. Put in the basics. Put in the basics. Because these this is are actually now. This is actually pronounced Lelanawar. <laughs> Lelanawar. Which printing, Alex? Are we doing revised? Are we doing unlimited? Unlimited. You know I like that unlimited. The dark ink. Are you the guy that's making the wallpaper of the unlimited elves? Is that why you have unlimited? Elves? I wish. No. I would never do that. I would never attach magic cards to a wall in a damaging way. Fiendhorn? That's not the old school spirit, Alex. The old school spirit says you have a alpha chaos orb. You're supposed to draw a dick on it. True. It's true. Who cares? It was required to. Uh, Ice Age. Yeah. Okay, got two elves. Okay. Uh, Quirion Ranger, please. This one. Classic. I knew this one was coming. As soon as you yeah. were going, I want to tap and untap and then tap and untap. I yeah. was like, he's going to pretty much have to put that in there. We're on Ranger. This is pretty cool art, actually. Alan Williams. Don't know what set this is from. The original is from Visions. Featured on a previous episode of the Old Mage MTG podcast back when we were called the Old Man Magic podcast. I believe we discussed it in the episode. Uh, Visions has some killer comments. There was, okay. at least the name, there was at least the name of the segment, if not the name of the episode. Query on Ranger. Okay, yeah, then um, uh, just for something fun, I guess I want to put in two of my... Uh, 
higher tier creatures, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Priest of Titania. Ooh, more mana elves. I like how you say manimals, Alex. Now, mm -hmm. you've been using it for quite a while. I wonder if any. Of the, I wonder how many people listening to us don't know what word is coming out of our mouth when we say manimals, because we made. Because <laughs> I made it. I made it up. It's a mana generating animal. <laughs> manimal. That includes elves, humans. We're all animals. I like it better than mana dorks. I hate that term. Yeah, I think manimal is much more distinguished, mm -hmm. much more dignified. This is a priest. They're not a dork. This is a ranger, not a dork. Warrior elves, not dorks. Okay. And then uh, piggyback, piggy, piggybacking off of what you were saying earlier, although I already, already had this on my list, she is Gothian Enchantress. She is also a druid. Oh, I did not know that. I guess I could have guessed. Yeah. These are so I'll bucks. have to try to find okay, some enchantments no. to help work with her. Human druid. I wouldn't have thought a human. I guess maybe yeah, I would have I wouldn't have either. I would have figured she was an elf. Elf, yeah. No idea. Let's go to the Urza Saga printing. That's the $42 one. How much are the... When was this reprinted? Eternal Masters, also $42.99. That can't be right. Nice. They can't be the same exact price as the Urza Saga, right? That doesn't make any sense. Seems like an error. Could it be? Yeah, that does seem unusual. Okay, so far you got a bunch of weak little elves and an <laughs> enchantress, and then you have your centaur. Your so centaur, far, so good. You sent your centaur commander. Yeah, may as well put a soul. Uh, well, and I'll wait on the soul ring because I nope. don't know if I'm even going to have a lot of like colorless mana stuff that I need to cast. So really, you're not oh. going to do the soul ring? You I, the kids... I, I probably will. It just depends on you know. I want to see how many mostly green and yeah. I'm gonna I have a, I'm gonna have a get ton it. of green one drops in here. I get it. Like there's gonna be a lot of green one drops. Probably not a lot of green two colorless drops. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I gotta switch you to I should switch you to grid view. Okay, your your Satan's power is coming together. Satan Alex says Satan's power. I say Satan's power or Satan's power, depending on my mood. Probably Satan's power. There's a college called Seton Hall. I don't remember if it's a college or university, actually. And it's spelled S-E-T-O-N. Seton Hall, it's a university in New, New Jersey. Seton Hall University. Uh, so there we go. I answered it. It's Seton. It's Seton Crows and Protector. <laughs> what is Seton Hall named after? Seton Hall University is a private Roman named Catholic research Satan. university in South Orange. Yeah, it's a private Roman Catholic research university named after Satan. Uh, founded by then Bishop James Roosevelt Bailey and named after his aunt, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. Seton Hall is the oldest, oldest diocesan university in the United States. Diocesan referring to a diocese. Elizabeth Ann Seton, this sounds like some old English bullshit, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Elizabeth Ann Seton was a Catholic religious sister in the U.S. Oh, and an educator? Where'd she come from? Socially prominent couple, a surgeon, Richard Bailey. Bailey and Charlton families were among the earliest European settlers in the New York area. I knew this was some English bullshit. Yeah. Uh, is Seton a university in England? Is it... I don't know. We'll figure that off the pod. I'll figure that out later. Anyways, I think that's the end. That's the end of <laughs> You can tell episode... because we're going wildly off track. <laughs> that's the end of episode 76 of the Old Maid MGD podcast, Alex. Unless you want to listen to me read more of Elizabeth Ann Seton's Wikipedia, I think we're going to head out. If 
any of you made it this far, I want to say, first of all, thank you. If you haven't already, please subscribe, hit the like button, hit the notification bell. If this is the type of thing you're interested in hearing more of on the podcast, if you would like to hear me read more about Elizabeth Ann Seton or diocese or other, you know, Roman Catholic universities on the podcast, let me know. I will read Wikipedia's if that's the kind of thing that gets us more you can read viewers. All day if people want that, it's fine. So leave a comment. If I hear back from you, if I get positive feedback, you'll hear more of this in episode 77 of the Old Mage MTG podcast. For now, we're signing off. Thank you.